Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, today's the final conclusion of get your ship together. Look at your neighbor and say, get your ship together, will you? And that's ship, S-H-I-P, P for polywog. And I know that many of us hopefully have been taking something away from this message. I hope that you have been looking at your own personal life and asking yourself, what area in my life do I need to get my ship together in? You know, maybe you need to get your ship together in your health. Maybe you need to get your ship together in your family, your finances. Maybe you need to get your ship together in your thoughts. Maybe you need to get your ship together in your commitment to Jesus. I don't know where you need to get your ship together. But the reality is this, is that we all have an opportunity to get it together. It's never too late to get it together. Right? You're here today. You have an option to get things together again in your life, in your family, in your home, in your calling, in your purpose, and God wants to do it. And as we celebrate Memorial Weekend, I want you to know that in getting our ship together, God wants us to be memorable as well. How many know that God wants you to be remembered way 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 past when you're gone like God wants to like I still remember so many amazing things my grandma taught me like farming like sewing there's so many wonderful things that I got from grandma grandpa he died when I was very little okay I don't remember much of him but I there are people in my life that have dropped some seeds of wisdom people in my life that have literally been the reason for who I am today, people that I respect, people that I honor. But you know what I really want? I want to be remembered while I'm still alive. You know, wouldn't it be nice to be remembered while you're still living and hear the wonderful things that you have, you have done for people, the blessings you've been to them? Like it sucks when people die and now it's a funeral for their life. And they're here, and, and you have all these people speaking all these wonderful things for everyone else to hear but the person that's already gone. That sucks. Like, I want us to be reminded of how important it is for us to leave a memory as well. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in the Bible in the red. Everybody say red. Okay, in the rojo, okay, the red, which I'm going to be preaching a message next weekend called red. And everything in the Bible that is in red were the words of Jesus himself. And he has something to say about Memorial Weekend as well. Are you ready? Okay, let's get into this. In Mark chapter 14, verse 8 through 9, he says this. She did what she could. We can just pause it right there, end it right there. She did what she could. He did what he could. When was the last time that you did what you could for God? She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare me to be buried, okay? What I'm about to tell you is true. What she has done, what she has what? Done. What she has what? Done. God wants us to be doers and not hearers only. God created us for relationship. And in this relationship, there is a give and take relationship that happens between us and God. God wants to bless you, but God also wants you to give. God wants to prosper you, but God also wants you to help others prosper. And it goes on. So what she has done will be told anywhere. The good news is preached all over the world. It will be as a what? It will be as a what? To who? Her. Isn't that amazing that Jesus would take literally a a an action of a person a woman in the bible that did something that was so profound something that was so sacrificial do you realize that god wants us to get our ship together in our lordship see it wasn't about the costly perfume because if you study the the scripture or the context of this story this perfume and I know I studied this many years ago. I think it was worth like something like in today's market, something like a thousand something dollars, two thousand dollars per. It was expensive perfume. As a matter of fact, it was the value of this perfume was worth literally a a pay wage of an entire year and maybe maybe even more than that. So this woman grabs what what 
what cost her something. She grabs something that was of value to her, something that was of worth to her, and then she starts pouring it out on Jesus. She starts washing his feet, washing his hair. I mean, she is literally putting the perfume on. She's putting the scent of her life on her Lord and Savior. And of course, the moment you start following Christ, let me just warn all of you, the moment you start being serious about your followership to Jesus, you're going to have people say things like this. Why are you always in church? Why do you have to go two times a week? Why are you always serving? Why are you giving to your church? Why? Are you... you know how I know that? Because Judas was hating on the woman who was doing something. And Judas looked at Jesus and said, tell her to stop. Are you kidding me? We could have sold that perfume and we could have fed the poor. And you know what? That's what people do. When you're finally, literally, completely just giving your entire life to Jesus, you're going to have people, sometimes, listen, sometimes even your own family are going to look at you and say, why are you always going to church? Like, why? Like, we could have done something better on Sunday. Like, we could have gone to the beach instead. For all you Memorial Weekend people. Yeah, we could have gone to the beach. We could have gone to the park. Man, we could have hung out. Like, just skip with Skip a Sunday. Dude, are you guys are you guys sticking with me? So so it wasn't the perfume that got Jesus' attention from this woman. It wasn't the costly perfume either. You know what it was? It was her action and the lordship that she had for Jesus. She knew what she was saved from, and she was willing to sacrifice whatever worth, whatever values she had to pour it out to Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Are you still pouring out your love to Christ? Are you still pouring out your love to God? Are you still pouring out love to people around you? Are you pouring it out or are you bottling it up? Come on, God wants us to be a, a drink offering to people that are far away from him. God wants us to be the very smell, the scent of heaven for people that get to meet us, huh? Come on, we are to be the perfume or the cologne of Jesus Christ wherever we go. When they see you, they smell heaven. When you walk in a room, the aroma changes. Forget the environment. Man, just the smell that walks, that walks into the room when you step in. It's so thick that people say, something changed in this room. That's what I want. How about you? That our aroma would be heavenly. And so I, I love that, that Jesus was drawn not, not to the perfume. He was drawn to the person. He was drawn to the action. He was drawn to the heart. Everybody say the heart. Because here's the truth, okay? The word of God is a seed, okay? Please stay with me. The word of God is a seed. And why do I say this with, to you? Because there's so many Christians today, there's so many people today that are going through stuff, whether it's health issues, financial issues, relational issues, family issues, uh, drama issues, whatever. And when you're going through stuff, we can be the most amazing, incredible complainers. Like you start comparing your life to someone else who's not facing what you're going through. And you know you go to church. You know you read your Bible. You know you pray. But for whatever reason, you're just never satisfied. You're always bothered by it. But let me tell you something. God's word is a seed. And your heart is the ground. And if that seed gets into the ground of your heart, that seed is... If it is truly, divinely, intentionally getting inside of your heart, that seed must, God puts a demand on his word. He is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And nothing that was made was made without what? The word of God. So the seed is God's word. That word has to go inside of your heart. And it's, when that word gets inside of your heart, it must produce fruit it's not an option it's not a suggestion when God says when my word gets in your heart I produce some things in you but what the but here's the problem but we got too many hearts that yes they they are soil but they're hard so the seed comes onto that soil but because it's so hard a hard heart the seed just stays on top and then when the birds come, they come and they eat the seed and they take the word from you. And then you start wondering, why am I not 
seeing God's fruit. Because you probably have no good soil. Don't hate on me now. That was a big amen right there. <laughs> Don't look at me strange. That's why the Bible says, and some reap 30, and some reap 60, and some reap 100 fold. Listen, you will, you will produce what you're willing to obey. And some of us obey God in this area, but not in this area. And some of us will obey God in this area, but not obey God in this area. God says, I want you to take my whole counsel, take the whole seed, and let's produce some serious fruit. And you watch and see what God will do. So I want you to know that this perfume was not, it, 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 was, it was more than just her, you know, giving her best uh, uh, offering. It was beyond that. Do you know that when you bring your tithe and your offering, it's not about the offering. It's not about a tithe. It's about your heart. It's about the heart. God says when you give, give cheerfully. Well, cheerfully only comes from your heart. So God's all about the heart of the people. So here's the question. So I have to remind myself, if this woman was, was a memorial in the eyes of Jesus, what was it about this woman that Jesus said, and, and, and this message, this, this, this scene of what just took place will be remembered and will be preached about all over the world. That means everywhere in every single part of this world, that verse has been read about a woman who was willing to do whatever it took to just do something for God. How amazing is that? How many want to be remembered now for doing good stuff for God? Right? I want that too. And so here's the truth. Here's the truth. You can write this down. Uh, Jesus is either Lord of all or Lord of nothing at all. That's just, let's just keep it real. Now I'm going to read a verse, and it's not to scare you. It's to just kind of wake us up a little bit, okay? I don't, I honestly, I like a lot of verses in the Bible. This is one of the verses that puts the fear of God in me. Literally. Y'all ready for it? Okay. This isn't to condemn. This is to just check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Are you ready? Matthew 7, 21 and 23 says this, not everyone. Ever say it, not everyone. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That, that's a hard pill to swallow. That's a hard pill to swallow. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants will enter. Only those who do what my, what? Father wants will enter only those only those who do what i wrote only those who do what i have told them will enter the kingdom of heaven many ever say many it didn't say some a few a fraction it said many what's many mean i mean it's just a whole lot of people many many will say to me on that day lord lord didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we go to Elevate Church twice a month? Didn't we lift our hands when they said, sing a hallelujah? Didn't, didn't I, I help out Ibrew Life Cafe, help a child here and there? Didn't I serve in the church? Didn't I read my, I mean, we can just go, we can go through the whole list, right? And he says this. Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them clearly, without any confusion, without any, I didn't understand that, without any come again, I never knew you. I never what? Knew you. So it's about relationship. It's not, it's not about, okay, let me go to church so I can feel better about myself. Let me go to church so that I can show my kids that this is what we do. We, 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 we check off the church off the task list. No, God wants us to have an intimate, personal relationship with him, with Jesus Christ himself. He doesn't want us to be, you know, it's funny this week. And if you're here, don't worry about it. You can just wave at me. This week I, I went out and uh, was having lunch with someone at, at a restaurant 
And, and I was walking in, and this lady goes, Pastor. And I'm like, Sister. <laughs> hey. And she's like, How's it, go, how's it going, Pastor? And she's like, you know what? I go, what? She's like, I'm one of your creasters. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know if that was a good thing or bad thing. I'm like, really? I go, I go you're one of my creasters? She's like, yeah, I'm one of your Christmas and Easter comers. I'm like, I'm like, but you know what? I, I did. I said that on Easter. I said I welcomed all the creasters back to church. I'm like, welcome, welcome back. Because they all claim to be, like, we had, like, close to 1,500 people here at Elevate Church. And, and listen, and they all claim, most of them, 90% of them claim Elevate Church is their church home. But they only come on Christmas and Easter. So it was like, welcome home. Great to see you guys again. High five. Yay. See you next year. <laughs> but she was sweet. She was like, no, I'm one of your creasters. But she said, no, for real. She's like, I need to come back to church. I'm like, cool. I'll see you Sunday. And she's like, yeah, okay, I got to go now. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> Okay, didn't we do many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them clearly, I never knew you. Get away from me, who, you who do what? Evil. And so you don't have to be the devil to do evil stuff. You don't have to be a demon to do demonic stuff. But I think all of us at some point have done something evil. All of us here. It, listen, when, 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 you don't, when you don't tithe, doesn't the Bible say, will a man rob God? And how will he rob God? Who can rob God? Those who don't tithe. I don't want to be a robber, right? That's evil, right? Come on, when God says, and it's by the stripes of Jesus Christ that you are whole and healed, and we just keep going against the grain of what God already said, that, that can be some evil in there. Well how, well, how can that be evil? The evil can be the fact that you're not willing to just believe that God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for you. And trust me, as I keep going, it's all going to come together. I'm going to wrap this baby up with a beautiful bow. Just pay attention. Evil can be you not being willing to forgive someone. Still holding on to resentment. Still being angry about something that took place in your life. That can be evil. Nobody wants to hear that, but that's an evil heart. An evil heart is when we no longer allow the seed of God's word to come inside and begin to produce good fruit, and let's start killing the bad fruit. Now, I know this is, it's, I know, I know, I'm trying. Okay, I want you to ask yourself a question. A hundred years from now, will it even matter that I was born? I want to ask you that. A hundred years from now. Will it even matter that I was born? Will it matter that you were born 100 years from now? Would it matter at all? I mean, because Jesus is talking about a memorial. Our military didn't start Memorial Weekend. Jesus started Memorial Weekend. Jesus was the perfect example of giving his life sacrificially. Jesus was the perfect example how we lay our life down for others. And so... A hundred years from now, will it even matter that I was born? Will anyone remember you? Not for, wow, wasn't he a good fisherman? Wow. You know, didn't they have a beautiful big house? Wow. I remember doing a, a, a funeral for a very prominent New York attorney. This guy was huge. And, uh, and they asked me if I can do the service, and I did it. And as I sat there and I listened to every person that walked up, all they talked about were about his attributes and nothing with his character. I was like, so I didn't even know the guy very well. You know what I'm saying? I went up there. I had to clean up all their mess. I'm like, okay, that's wonderful that he was a great attorney, you know, won many cases. But let's talk about the man now. He was a father. He was a husband. Wasn't perfect, obviously, like none of us are. But start trying to remember something good in this man's life. That's what God wants. In other words, are the things I'm living for worth Christ dying for? What are you living for? What are you living for? I'm proud of you that you came to church this Sunday. I'm proud of you. Because you're living, you're living to lead your family closer to Jesus. But what are you living for? What you're living for now, does it say the worth 
of Christ dying for you because the woman with the perfume showed the value of what Jesus was about to do. Mind you, she was preparing him for his burial. You and I, we're preparing him for his comeback. Do you still believe that Jesus is coming back? Does anybody believe that Christ is coming back? Listen, as a Christ follower, you know what we do? We're like that guy, I don't know what they call him, you know, at LAX airport, when they're like, like, what are those guys called that are like waving the planes in? The marshators? Thank you so much. Man, we're the marshators, man. We're just like, boom, come on. That's what we're doing with Jesus. Come on this way. Woo! Come on, Jesus. Bring her in. That's what we do. You know how we do that? Jesus said this, until every single human being on planet earth has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ at least once, then I'll come. Are you preaching the gospel? Because the commission, not the suggestion, the great commission he gave every single one of us was to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the only way that you can say, yes, I am bringing him back is if you're actually going out and winning souls. If you're not, then you're not bringing him back. Just let that simmer right there, okay? Add a little bit of oregano, some garlic, some a Westchester sauce. Some of you are like, yeah, put in the Bud Light. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, here's a true story. So I was just, I'm like, how does this connect with everybody? So I started looking for something that would be a little bit more practical. So the Guinness Book of Record, have you guys ever seen some of those stories? Like, this is the Guinness Book of World Records. And there was this one dude. I try to find something that would be like crazy out there. I think I found him. And this guy uh, has the record of eating glass, metal, and wood. Okay, check this out. He's eaten 10 bicycles, a supermarket cart, seven television sets. But the most astonishing, you think they're like, oh my God. No, the most astonishing thing that he's ever eaten, like this is what he's remembered for in the Guinness Book of Record, World Record, is that he ate a Cessna light flying aircraft. He literally grinded the entire aircraft and mixed it in with his food and then ate this aircraft. And what's interesting is that this guy spent 15 minutes of his most famous moment of life eating an aircraft my only thought as I was finding this, I'm like, I wonder what it's going to look like when this guy stands in the presence of Almighty God, the one that we and you and I are going to call Lord, Lord, right? And when the Lord turns around with a gentle, loving, giving voice and says, Son, what did you do with the life I have given you or gave you? What is going to be his response? I ate a plane. What's going to be your response? What's going to be our response? God is not asking you to have a pulpit ministry. God is not asking you to do something that brings recognition to you. You want recognition? Preach Christ. You want recognition? Win souls. You know what we do most of our life? We spend it complaining about what hasn't happened, what didn't happen, and what should have happened. And that is the distraction of the enemy who comes to drift us away, drift us away from the divine purposes of heaven. So what happens? We abandon our lordship. We abandon our faith. We abandon our trust. We abandon our peace sometimes. All for what? Like, what are you going to tell God? I spent my whole life complaining about what you didn't do, God. I spent my whole life building my business, my app, my my medical career, my... Now, listen, all that stuff is cool, but, but God's going to be like, hey, listen, um, all that gift, all that talent, I was free 99, I gave that to you. What I'm asking you is what did you do for me? I didn't ask you what I did for you. I know what I did for you. But what did you do for me? It's quiet up in this Presbyterian church. We could be Catholic today, I don't know. 
I love the Catholics and the Presbyterians, so don't write me an email. <laughs> it happens. Everybody say this to me. Say, I belong to God because he created me. Okay? So if I belong to God because he created me, then here's the question. Then does the creator not have absolute authority over his creation? Yes or no? Okay. If that's the truth, then we need to start obeying. Okay, let's go. Let me show you some verses to back up, back this up. Deuteronomy 10, 14, quickly. It says, the heavens belong to the Lord your God as does the earth and everything. Where? In it. Everything. So look at your neighbor and say, you belong to God whether you like it or not. Yeah. You do. I was on the radio this week. And, uh, and, and you know what? When you're on the radio, you got to be very careful what you say. But... You know, I had to end with a bang, you know what I'm saying, on the radio because it's kind of secular. And I said, you know what, here's the deal. I said, for those of you that might be far away from God, here's the truth. You don't have to believe to belong to God because you belong before you ever believed because you're his son and daughter. You've just been far away, and he's calling you back. And God wants his kids back. Amen? God wants his kids back. Okay, number, uh, or not number two, but uh, Psalms uh, 100 verse 3 says this. He made us, and we are his, and we are his people. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, a man's way of life is not his own. Huh? You're not the boss of you. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Huh? Aren't you glad that he paid the bill? Look at this. No one who walks determines his own steps. Now, I get it. God wants us to enjoy our life. God wants us to enjoy the desires of our heart. But here's the deal. You'll never know the desires of his heart until you know him. If you don't know him, you don't know what he desires for you. You only know what you desire, your flesh desires. Romans 14, 7, 8 says this, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. In other words, it's a win-win. If I live, I'm his. If I die, I'm his. It's all good. I'm his. Isn't that a good thing? But here's what happens to us. Let me just do a quick drawing. So this is what, what our life looks like. And hopefully this makes sense. So when you come to Christ, we all start this way, right? We come to Jesus. But then there is a decision of whether he is Lord of all or Lord of nothing at all. And it's, it's a decision that you and I have to make regardless of what you face. And so we start out here. And we're happy, right? And we start climbing. But along the way, sometimes what happens with Christians, because they thought that once you became a Christian, that you should never, ever, ever, never have a problem on earth ever again. Like once you come to Christ, you should never be challenged in your health. You should never be challenged in your finances. You should never be challenged in your marriage. You should never be challenged with your kids. You should never go through any storm. You should never go through any, That's a lie. It's, we all will face stuff on this earth. Every single one of us. Nobody gets away. You, you, but you still have a decision how you're going to respond. And so what happens is when you, he, Hebrews 11, 6, 6 says this. It says, um, he says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must, it didn't say hopefully, must believe that he is God right? And that he is a rewarder. Ever say rewarder? Come on, anybody like rewards? And he's a rewarder. That's what that says, reward. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. Diligently. I don't stop. I don't quit. I continually diligently seek him. So what happens is we start coming up, we start coming up, and then we start changing the path. And then we're here. 
And then you know what happens? And notice I did up and downs because being, being, being a guy or a girl who's following Jesus, you're going to have ups and downs and ups and but you're still going at least. Praise God. You're still going. You're not, you're not turning back. But the person that says, you know what, I don't know, and they start, you know, everything, God's fault, it's their fault, my fault, every, and you just start, to, you know what you do? You're coming to a place of loss. And God wants to reward his people. But let me tell you something. Do you know the only reward comes through faith? We have to have faith in God. We gotta, we gotta work on our faith. We gotta stop being so angry and upset when things don't happen. I get it. Sometimes you don't understand why am I going through this. Let me, let me, let me tell you something that I have learned, and I have, I have been through it. If you want to bring out a measuring stick, I'll bring it to you, man. I've been through every possible thing you can think of. We have faced death, not three four times in our family four times death where where i'm saying doctors said your son's dying your daughter's dying your wife's dying i'm dying four times okay we've been in seasons where where people have literally come against us where people have spoken ill of us we've come in moments where people that you trusted people that you you were willing to do anything for come and they stand i mean there's been one thing after another and then and then things that have happened i mean we literally just came out an amazing wonderful <laughs> glorious attack you know but it was all for the glory of god let me tell you because just two weeks ago man we got the most amazing incredible news i was like yeah so y'all don't see this because i show up every time i'm just preaching my heart out but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes the hell the trouble the trials the storms man they're 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 faithful every like our bills faithful every month <laughs> man listen bills are more faithful than most christians so what happens why do we start doing that why do we go down why do we go to a loss here's why we start declining when it gets rough we start declining when things don't go our way. We start declining when we get distracted. When your attention is all on you and not on Jesus anymore, we decline. We go, you're going to see a loss. It's not, it's, it's, this, is, this is one of those dumb moments like, duh. Yes, you're going to feel that way because you know what? You, you, you have stopped trusting and believing God. You, you decided that God's not enough for you. That's the reality. But a lot of us don't like to hear that because I've noticed that Christians are the most sensitive people. They're the most offended people. They are. Look at your neighbor, Tom. I think he's telling the truth. Tom, I'm offended that he said that right now. <laughs> if you got offended that I just said that, I'm talking to you. I just validated my point. Usually offended, you get distracted. When you can't forgive, when you keep holding on to resentment, that will bring you down to a loss. It doesn't bring life. And the challenge for every single one of us that are called believers, we need to recognize that God must be the master of this ship. That God must be the captain of this ship. That God must be the Lord and Savior of this ship. And anything outside of that is just you. And we struggle with that. All of us do. It reminds me of a story of a guy named Jonah. Do you guys remember Jonah? So Jonah, man, God, God sent him to do a mission, to go to the place, a place called Nineveh. Nineveh was filled with sin, and it was dark, and, and Nineveh was, it was, listen, it wasn't just about, like, drinking beer and, you know, uh, partying and, you know, doing, doing lights and the whole thing. No, I mean, there was bestiality happening here. There was all kinds of deep, dark sin and, and one thing I have, I have learned about God is that, is that God will tolerate your sin for a season. But he wants to get you set free. So he tolerated their junk over and over. And then God calls Jonah, who was his spokesperson, his prophet. And he tells Jonah, go to the people of Nineveh and tell them, I will no longer tolerate this anymore. If they do not repent and turn from their wicked ways, I will destroy them all. And you know what happened with Jonah, right? Jonah was like, uh, <laughs> nope. And he disobeyed God, and he went opposite the direction of Nineveh. He went to Joppa. He got on a boat on a ship, right? And he makes his way to a place called Tarshish where he should not be. And during this journey on this ship, 
all hell breaks loose. Let me tell you something. God will love you, and God will do things sometimes that will wake you up, not because he's trying to harm you, but because he tries to get your attention. God isn't, aren't you glad that God brings us warnings? And he brought a warning to, to Jonah, and he whipped up, listen, there's, there's, if you read Peter's story, when he went across and, the, and there was a storm when they were going to do this, that was, a, that was a storm that was whipped up by the devil. Okay, this story right here, this was a storm that was whipped up by God. And God whips up a storm for these people. But when God whips up a storm, God doesn't destroy. <laughs> he just gets your attention. Like, oh, okay, yes, sir. Aye, aye, captain. Right? And the storm comes and it hits and they're on this voyage and, and the, the ship is threatened to be, you know, capsized. And, and everybody, what's pretty amazing is that all the people that were on the ship, they all had their own gods. So, you know, they told, okay, everybody pray to your gods that this storm. So everybody was praying to their own gods and not one God would respond. And then they realized, like, wait a minute. They started doing a count like, hey, there's one missing. Who's the guy missing? Like, oh, there's some dude sleeping downstairs. Oh, let's go talk to that fool. So they go down there to the ship, like, do, do, do. And they said, hey, yo, what are you doing, man? And, and Jonah's waking up, like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm just, just sleeping in the boat. He's like, dude, the ship is sinking. What are you doing down here? What did you do? Pray to your God. And so Jonah's like, ah. Oh. And so he knew he got caught. And so Look at Jonah chapter 1, verse 10 through 17. It says they found out that he was running away from the Lord. <laughs> Anybody want to run from God anymore? <laughs> Look, they found out that he was running away from the Lord. But that's because he told him, like, yeah, what's happening is that the reason that this ship is going down is because I'm with you. You know, there's two things to learn about the story. One is, is your own disobedience. But two, sometimes we bring the wrong people on our ship. Like you're wondering why you're not getting closer to God. That's because you got all the wrong people on your ship. You got all the wrong shipmates. And you need to overthrow some shipmates off the boat. Right? Sometimes you're wondering like why? Why is everything falling apart? Why is this business not working? Why is it failing? Why aren't we prospering? Here's why. Because God says do not be unequally yoked. You got to be around people that have the same faith, that connect, that are going the same direction. You can't be thinking that you're going to be a successful follower of Jesus Christ and you're still playing around with the wrong people. It ain't going to happen. So sometimes it, the reason that you're not seeing progress is not necessarily something that you did wrong. Sometimes it's because you have the wrong people on the ship. And when you got the wrong people on the ship, you ain't going to go very far. Do you need to take inventory or friend inventory and ask yourself, who's on my ship? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, get your ship together. No, and I didn't mean your spouse, so calm down. That's because he had told them, then they became terrified. So they asked him, how could you do a thing like that? How could you disobey God? Are you crazy? And the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down? He says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. He replied, then it will become calm. I know it's my fault. That's this, that, that, that this terrible storm has come on you. Those are powerful words. So those are hard words for us to say, huh? Like when was the last time you said, I know it was my fault? Like we're so good at pointing the finger. Like, let me tell you something. You know, Jesus in, in the Bible talks about people that are very religious, you know. Uh, you know that story where uh, there's Christians that are so good at, like, pointing out people's crap? Like, I, I'm good. I can find dirt on anybody. Like, it's easy to find dirt, but it's hard to dig gold, huh? And, and Jesus was, like, having an issue because the Pharisees and the Sadduce Sadducees, they were all just, like, always looking for flaws in people. Like, you know, oh, you, you, you need to change your attitude. You need to, you, you should really stop, you know, doing what you're doing. And blah. But what does Jesus respond to these people that were all being religious? Just, you know, like when we do, like, you know, the Halloween thing we do here, every year I always got one or two that come to me and get all mad at me. But it's like this. Jesus says, hey, listen. Why don't you worry about the plank in your eye <laughs> than the speck in your brother's eye? And it's like, oh, Pastor Mauricio, you really shouldn't be doing this 
you know, this Halloween event, man, you know, you're smacking people while they're talking to me. You know, it's an evil night. It's a very dark, dark. Or, or you look at somebody, you're like, you know, sister, you really shouldn't be hanging around with those guys, you know. That may, and, you, and we go around and we walk around with this, this plank. Jesus is like, dude, why don't you deal with your plank instead of talking about your brother's speck. You know what's a speck? My God, it's like a little sawdust. We got too many plankers in the church, you know what I'm saying? Hey, hey, hey praise the Lord. Yeah, you really shouldn't be doing that. But, but, but come on. You're so good at finding the dirt. How about be the greatest gold digger in the good way? (laughs) And how about we bring out the best in people and not look at the worst, not try to search for the worst? Huh? Yeah. Jonah had a plank in his eye. I'll tell you why. But they couldn't. The sea got even rougher. Then they cried out, Lord. They prayed, please, Lord, don't let us die for taking this man's life. After all, he might not be guilty of doing anything wrong, so don't hold us responsible for killing him. Lord, you always do what you want to do. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God always does what he wants to do? Whether you, listen, whether you're on board or not, he's going to do what he's going to do, with you or without you. So you might as well start helping build God's house because he's going to do it with you or without you. I want to be a part of with him. And the stormy sea became calm. Then the men saw what had happened, and they began to have great respect for the Lord. Oh, I forgot. They threw him overboard. And then they offered a sacrifice to him, and they made promise to him. You know what? Here's the quick question. What ideas, what thoughts, what ideologies, what fears, what lies, what doubts, what unbeliefs do you need to throw overboard right now? What attitude do you need to throw overboard? What lack of commitment do you need to throw overboard? And I know that there's so many believers, wonderful people, but they lack commitment to Jesus. They just won't commit to him. It's their way or the highway. When you stand before God, you tell him that. Tell me how that's going to go. It's not going to go good for you. There's lack of forgiveness. There's that fear of failure. All these things have to be, listen, abandon them. Throw that stuff overboard. And of course, we know that Jonah then makes it to Nineveh and he preaches after they threw him over, a fish eats him. He repents for three days, three nights, and tells God, you're so good, God, forgive me. I was being dumb, goofy. And he just did that to get his way again. So the fish spits him out on the land. He goes there, and for 40 days, he preaches the gospel, everything God said. And the people actually turn their hearts back to God. And he was like, He was so angry while he was doing this too. You know why? Because once he was done and everyone turned their life back to Jesus, Jonah went and he sat and he was pouting. And God said, what's wrong with you? Why are you so downtrodden? Why is your face and your countenance down? He said, this was a waste of time. I knew it. I knew it. He's like, I knew it. I knew you were going to show them goodness. I knew it. You were going to show them mercy. I knew that you were going to be gracious. I knew it. You were going to be tender and loving towards them. And they don't even deserve it, Plank. Well, let me tell you something. It's not part of the message, but I'll end it with this. Is Here's the reality. Is that after that, you never hear another thing of Jonah. The only thing he was remembered for was for being a religious spirit complaining on what people deserved instead of accepting the grace and the mercy that God displayed to Jonah and so many times as Christians we forget how good God has been people ask me Mauricio why are you still friends with that people man they're a little bit weird here's why because I remember the good they were to me so I don't cut people 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 cut me but I won't cut others you can leave my life and I'll be like, okay, bye. That's cool. I'm cool with that. But I'm always going to stay a friend. If you need anything, I got gotcha. you. Right? You got to have that spirit. And so I want to talk to you about, write these seven points down. These will be good for you. Quickly. Lordship affects your future in seven ways. Number one. When you know the lordship of your Savior, it releases supernatural provision for your life. 
when he is Lord of all, he is Lord of vision. That means he supplies the need, guys. He meets the need when you make him Lord. Number two, when you make him Lord of your life, when he has lordship over you, it provides protection. That means no matter what you're going through, and let me tell you something, we did, we went through a very hellish thing for the last two years here. None of you would have ever known it. Hellish. Hard. Stressful. All because we were building the church. We had a Goliath called the city trying to rise up against us. And when I stood there before the judge, he says, well, you know, you sure you know what you're doing right now? I said, I know what I'm doing. I'm standing up for what I believe. But when he's the Lord of your life, he protects you. And everything just shifted two weeks ago. And the favor of God came upon us. And no weapon formed against you will prosper. And though a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 more at your right hand, it will not come near you. Number three, when you have lordship, it demands the death of pride. When, you, when he's not the Lord of your life, you're arrogant and prideful. You're, 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 you, have a, you have a plank in your eye. You don't like, I, why do I have to do it that way? You start, listen, when you start the pointing of the finger, you're worse. Listen, you're as bad or as worse as the devil. Because in the Bible, he's called the accuser of the brethren. And he does this. Put your finger down. Because if he's Lord, then he's Lord over your finger. Number five. No, number four, right? When he has lordship in your life, it is often preceded by a season of discomfort. Huh? I, don't, I, don't, I feel so uncomfortable. Good. Now you're growing. But I shouldn't be feeling this. No, yes, you should. If you have no discomfort in your walk with Christ... I would question it and say something's wrong with you. You should be constantly uncomfortable with God and God should be comfortable with you. I'll let that simmer too. Look, carne asada right there. Shh. Number five, lordship releases the presence of God on your life. It releases it. You walk into a room, you change it. Smells different up in this place. I like this. When people walk into Elevate Church, I always say, they always say this. All new people say this. Man, you can feel the presence of God there. When you walk in a room, do people feel the presence or they, do, they, do they smell you? We need a heaven aroma, amen? amen. Smell your neighbor. No, don't smell them. Just kidding. <laughs> Number six. Lordship prevents exposure to sinful situations and temptations you will encounter. When, you, when he's Lord over your life, man, he will expose it quickly and try to save you fast. But when you're filled with pride, you fall. Number seven, Lordship can help you to avoid future problems. In other words, the angel of the Lord will go before you. It's not that you won't have problems. It's that it can help avoid problems that are unnecessary that maybe you and I create. Amen? Amen. Close your stuff. I want to speak to people that don't have Christ. How do, how do I do that, Pastor? Three simple ways to surrender. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you have just had religion in your life, if you know it hasn't been real, today you can get it right. Today. If it's just been kind of like, ugh. no, today God wants intimacy with you. He wants to know you personally. You don't want him, you don't want him to say to you, I didn't know you. Yeah, but I knew you. Yeah, God said, yeah, you knew me because I was faithful. But I didn't know you. So three reasons why you need to know him. Number one, you surrender to him because God is all wise and knows better than anyone else what is best for your life. He knows what's best for you. You don't know what's best for you. 
God knows what's best for you. Why? He created you. Number two, he is almighty and has the power to accomplish what is best for you. You can accomplish what you can in your own wisdom, your own strength. But let me tell you something. You get linked up with God and you'll accomplish much more. I, I, am, a, I am, a, I'm a standing example of that from loser to serving Jesus with all my heart. I did more with him and I still do more with him. And number three, God loves me more than anyone else does. Listen, you may say, well, man, nobody loves me. Nobody understands me wrong. God loves you and God understands you. He knows you better than anyone. If you're looking for love, you know, well, I want my daddy to love me. I want my mommy to love me, whatever. You know, people mistreated me. Okay, here's the deal. People are people. People hurt. People have love, but it's it's conditional. God has unconditional love, and he never fails you, and he never leaves you, and he never forsakes you. So here's the deal. If you're here today and you want to know this love, this Lord, this Savior who wants to lead you, guide you, and give you divine purpose, when I counted three, your hands will go up. At the 8 a.m., I was shocked how many people came to Christ. I know there's people sitting here today, and you know it's time. You've, you've had religion. You haven't had a relationship. You know it. You know it. Every eye closed, every head bowed, please, in honor of those who are going to receive Christ today. Listen to me. Stop going the opposite direction of God. He loves you. He wants to help you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. When I counted three, I want you to lift your hand and respond to heaven today because Jesus wants to enter your ship like a flood and he wants to set you on sail to his holy purposes. He's not looking for perfect. He's looking for a person who wants a relationship with him. Are you ready? If that's you and you're out there and you're saying, I want to know Jesus like that at the count of three. One, come on, you're not afraid. Two, you're going to stop running from God and you're going to run to God today. One, two, three. If that's you, lift your hand high quickly. High, high, quickly. I see all those hands in the back. Thank you. Lift it high quickly. High, leave it up. That's awesome. I see the hand too. Cool. You can put it down now. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All of you that lifted your hand, you definitely pray this and everyone join with us. Let's all pray this. Say, Jesus, thank you so much for saving me and rescuing me from my deep sins, sins that were separating me from Almighty God. Today, I receive you as Lord of my life. I receive you in the ship of my heart. Today, I'm born again, filled with new life for your holy purposes. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me and quitting on me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. For all of you that lifted your hand, thank you so much for being bold and for doing that at the end of the service. Please, don't let this be just a moment experience. Let's make this a lifetime. Let's make this a journey. Let's make this a voyage. And we invite you to keep coming back, keep connecting with us, keep, you know, hearing God's word. And that word will change your life. It'll transform your life. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.